Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Raw Knuckles Podcast. Please like, follow, and subscribe. Are you ready to lace up your skates and dive headfirst into the rink? Look no further than my fight club. Raw Knuckles, exclusive Patreon. I'm a heavyweight here. I'm Chris Nyland, and let me tell you about the fight club. You'll gain access to the raw, unfiltered conversations that make Raw Knuckles the ultimate hockey podcast. Say goodbye to interruptions and commercials with our ad-free episodes. Dive deeper into the stories that shape the sport with uncensored interviews that will keep you on the edge of your seat. But that's not all. As a member of any tier in the Fight Club, you'll also receive a 10% discount on all Knuckles merch so you can show off your inner badass wherever you go. And let's not forget about the puck load of exclusive content waiting for you. So what are you waiting for? Head over to Patreon to join the Raw Knuckles Fight Club and experience hockey like never before. Click the link below to get started. But I think that you could probably save it to the locker room. There you go. Unless, Niles, it's... Hey! It's, fuck off, oh, Niles. Fuck. <laughs> Come on. Don't be taking advantage of me now. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Knuckles. Nyland going ballistic. He's a freaking madman. I'm Chris Nyland, and this is the Raw Knuckles Podcast. As you do every TNT broadcast from Atlanta, not New York, right? No, the only time we travel is sometimes the first game of the year, and then uh, like on site, and then playoffs for this year will be the conference finals, because that's as far as we go. Last year, we traveled for the finals because we had the finals. The year before that, we were uh, Western Conference Finals, Edmonton, Colorado. Cool, cool. So Listen, we only have the right What are you flying? Private? You flying private or first class? What do you got going? <laughs> no, no, no. Come He's on. flying on a pink jet. I'm a fucking peasant. I, you know what though? They get us Delta first class, and fucking, it basically feels like I'm on a private plane. Fuck, it's uh, awesome. Yeah, first class is awesome. <laughs> Listen, Biz, I, I want to. You know, we talk about athletes. We see athletes who retire. They have issues after they retire. They have a hard time transitioning out of the game. I don't know if people can really appreciate just what a awesome transition you made from professional sports, hockey, into the real world. You're so popular. You know, the big hockey name, Gretzky, Bedard, now Crosby, Lemieux. But Biz's name is as big as all of them. Oh, now, you're out of your fucking mind. No, but uh, people <laughs> know who Biz is. And I'm serious. I'm not out of my fucking mind. Yeah. I, and and yeah. what I want to know, yeah. that transition from from hockey to to the world you're in now, w- did you plan on this? No. Were you kind of looking ahead to this? Or w- what was your plan for after hockey? So I would say it's obviously a lot of luck and, and, you know, things happening for a reason. You could use every cliche. So I would say it was based off two things, all that kind of happening and then also an element of fear. From the the situation of, of kind of like it just slowly took place and everything was happening for a reason was like starting Twitter and getting on social media. And I was always silly and a clown and loved the locker room and Even when I was playing in junior, when I was, like, playing 20 minutes as a D-man, like, I was still fucking around in the locker room, probably as a result as why why it didn't really transfer into my pro game. But I also – but then I was moved from D to forward where when you're the fighter, um, Knuckles, you kind of get to, I guess, be the clown a little bit, right? Yeah. So it kind of worked out that way. And then jumping on social media and then showing that personality – and, and also, like, I, I kind of like to act and do silly shit, and, like, I, I love that stuff. So the, the Twitter snowballed and get, into getting, like, side gigs with Sportsnet, uh, doing some independent stuff, starting to get comfortable in front of the camera. With, with all the Twitter stuff led to me getting more, like, interviews and, like, post-media scrums and stuff where normally a guy who was being healthy scratch 50% of the time, you weren't getting a lot of media reps. But I was, so I, I was starting to become comfortable in front of the camera and, and also interacting with like, you know, whoever it was like Todd Walsh, I mean, who's in Arizona, we would go back and forth all the time. So that element 
along with the fear element where when I I couldn't get an NHL contract, it was after my five year with the Coyotes, I went to a PTO in St. Louis and loved it and had a blast and was praying that I would at least get an AHL deal with them. So if let's say Revo went down. So I the fear the, was the fear. Sorry. But was the fear like yeah, my career is going to be over? I don't know what, what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. He asked. He asked me how this all kind of happened. Yeah. And I said oh, along yeah, yeah, with yeah, that's right. along with everything kind of happening for a reason, and then the, also the the fear element was I was uh, when I was depressed on my couch because after playing five years pro, I went to a PTO in St. Louis, had an awesome camp, had fun at camp. The guys were amazing, and. I couldn't even get an AHL deal because they had no contracts left. So I went home for a month and sat on my couch. And so there, like I had nothing go. I was depressed. And, and the fear came from like when I, my career was going to be over, regardless when it was, you had to get up and get moving. Like nobody was going to save you. Right. So I had been, I had, I had felt that, but fortunately for me, I was able to get a deal in the American hockey league, uh, like about a month after that. Um, didn't work out in Portland where I was, went to Manchester, won a Calder Cup. It like completely changed my like life around. But the fear that was struck to me in that month of not having a career and it being in the hands of others forced me to start thinking about when I retired, what were you going to do and how were you going to hit the ground running? So that's kind of, sorry, I know it was a, a long-winded answer, but there was a lot of components that drove me into what I do now and why it's evolved. Like I get up every day and it's all I think about. Like, I don't really have a ton of a personal life. Like I, I don't, you know, I don't have, I don't have a wife or kids. So there was, there's a lot of factors involved and, and then here we are, but I appreciate the compliment and it's like you said those other names it's just like no i i'm not on that level i'm just some silly clown who is a jester in the locker room yeah. who's been able to transfer it into media yeah no one no there's no kids like they're not paul bissonette in their driveway scoring game seven overtime right like no one's doing that, is that what you're <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly they might pick up a podcast like at best buy and, and drop a few f-bombs and that's <laughs> that's the inspiration i'm providing and by the way oh i have a i have a funny knuckle story so he called me about a month ago to do this and i i was referring to him as niles and i just i don't know i think you know chris nylon i feel like niles is such a cool name so the whole whole conversation (laughs) i'm going back and forth calling this to me and at the end he's like hey biz uh, can i ask you a favor and i'm like yeah what's up niles he's like don't call me Niles. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why do you hate me? Because that- I hate I hate people calling me by my last name or something like that. Okay. Um, I, I, I thought honestly, you were I think me. it's disrespectful. No. That's why. Okay. I, like I don't I I don't like calling people by their last name unless it's <laughs> part of their nickname, like a Stapes. Okay. Oh, f- so. Timmy, I thought I was being so cool. Like, what's up, Niles? He's like, don't, don't call me that. You yeah. <laughs> You're one Niles away from being you? in a trunk. From being in a trunk but, of a car. <laughs> yeah, exa- buddy, exactly. And when he ta- when he spoke like that, I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I'm like, how the f- like, how do guys fight this guy in the NHL? He's so scary. He just turned it on like that. Get into the action with Fight Club, Raw Knuckles' new exclusive Patreon. From ad-free episodes to uncensored content and discounts on merch, there's something for every hockey fan. Join the Fight Club today. Got ya. Biz, I just got done watching. It was a a video of, like, all seven of Paul Bissonnette's goals. He had some good ones in there. Yeah, yeah. So I think one time the announcer, the announcer was like, "I don't uh, even think he knew he scored." <laughs> <laughs> was that the Price goal? The Kevin, yeah, the one against Price. Foot. I wasn't watching. That's why when that Zach Benson scored that one between his legs last night, I go, "It looked it looked exactly like the one I scored." My first. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so uh, now the funny part: where's it come from? One and then two interjection interjecting the humor into your analysis when you're doing tnt it's different than being on chicklets right you can say what you want on chicklets you you find you have to kind of hold back when you're on tnt sometimes 
Yeah, just it's just a different filter, and that's why sometimes like I'll, I'll it'll get thrown to me, and I'll, I'll you'll see my wheels just like <laughs> you can almost like see it on my face, uh, just kind of being like, yeah, you can't you can't say that. Like I was worried yesterday about the you know clean and jerk and the snatch because we were talking about the Olympic lifts I used to do training and. You know, things, some things can be, can get <laughs> yeah. true, but yes, the double filters hard. And that's why, like, I'll really make sure I get my rest on a game day and make sure I'm kind of fresh and top to mind. But also like from a humor standpoint, you're, we're, we're trying to be silly idiots on chicklets. Like we like, I like just getting people going, like talking about William Nylander being the it guy and, you know, t- talking to him about him whipping his hog out with Madison beers on zoom, <laughs> just like silly, sh- stupid <laughs> shit. But On the broadcast, I always want to make sure we're also teaching a lot because we're talking to the American viewer. So I think that people always want to learn more about the game. And then obviously the humor is important, too, because you want to you want to give them a little bit of everything you want to like. I love it when like Wayne talks about these stories, these old school stories behind the scenes and and. Knuckles, I'm sure you know him to a certain degree. He is like a hockey nerd, like in a, in a positive way where he's consumed so much about the game and his memory is ridiculous. Yeah. He remembers all these stories through history of hockey and like he, you know, anything about Guy Lafleur or Gordie Howe, like he is, he was obsessed with hockey growing up. And uh, Gordy Howe is like his idol, and it, it, it was—it's cool to see because Gordy Howe also gave back so much to the game, and he always was available, and you know, autographs for everybody, and got to do these interviews, and like the fact that he's even still doing the panel. But I think that because he idolized him, he took that away, where he feels like he's indebted to the game forever, which it's amazing to see, and it's amazing for hockey fans and anybody who gets to listen to him share all these stories on air so yeah it's awesome tnt you got chiclets all the stuff you do you're constantly going like you said you need to get your rest what what do you get the most enjoyment out of is it chiclet like you do the chiclets cup you do the golf you do the you know, ball hockey thing with um, what's that ugly face kid yeah, nose the nose what, what's his <laughs> oh, yeah. nose nose face killer. nose face nose he's face. actually from Boston is he yeah Boston Good. area we we do these some people who are listening might not know what you're talking about we do these ball hockey tournaments and we threw the first one in Detroit like I wasn't even playing it was Grinelli's idea I'm like okay we'll go there we got banged up for three four days and this. Kids showed up first day, just like, like, like in my face. I'm like, what? He's like, we're going to win this tournament. We don't even care that Wierenski's team's playing. Knuckles, Wierenski, an NHL all-star, had a bunch of him and his hockey buddies playing in the tournament. And sure enough, that that, uh, nose face killer, so he's became a villain in the Chicklets world, he beat him in the round robin. (laughs) <laughs> and he like bloodied up Wierenski's nose. So Wierenski and his team were like, we're going to speed bag these guys when we meet them back in the finals. And the, this nose face guy took his team to the finals and then they beat them again in the finals. Wow. So I'm like, I'm like this motherfucker. I'm like, I'm playing in the next ball hockey and I'm getting Terry Ryan involved. Cause I know he plays. Yeah. Oh yeah. And Terry plays. So we stack our team, buddy. And we go to Vegas for the second annual Chicklets Cup. They beat they beat us in the round robin, and then they mercy us in the finals. We have we've yet to win one of our own ball hockey tournaments, and we're bringing in pros. But what's crazy is so we we've now we're now on the fourth one. We did the last one in Buffalo. We went Buffalo back to back. He won the third one again. But now teams are starting to hear about it from the ball hockey community. So us and nose face killers team we didn't even reach the finals this year wow. it was two other teams that beat us out in in the semis so yeah that is one thing that has bought, brought my competitive juices back in the chicklets world is doing these ball hockey tournaments but knuckles doing these ball hockey tournaments after you're done playing the whole weekend and you're having right. some pops yeah. your body i felt like i was a crash test dummy dummy in a car accident dude <laughs> I was so I was hurting, but yeah, that is why such is a fun no, element to our so job. Good? And, <laughs> nose what? face killer. What's yeah, so good about so him much? and his team? They, they... Do you know him, Tim? Nose face. 
No, but I'm like offended that he's you beaten, know you know, our honey. I don't fucking know him. <laughs> he's offended. He, I'm, um, I'm like mad he, right now. He just, he's been, he's been doing it. He's been doing it his whole life. And he's just, he's got like a cleft lip and he talks a lot of stuff. And, and like, I swear to God, every time I, we see him, he gets uglier and uglier. And hey, I'm not the best <laughs> looking guy either. Like, you know, we could chirp each other and we joke about it. But we, so I just, I just started calling him the nose face killer. <laughs> and I think that Brad Marshaw was kind of, isn't that his nickname too? So he's almost like the Brad Marshaw slash, like he's the goat of ball hockey. We've, we've established him as this <laughs> ultimate villain, the nose face killer. <laughs> so um, <laughs> nose face killer. I love it. And, and so all, all those things you do, all the things you do what, what, for you, what is like the most fun for you to do? You really look forward to it. I would say the Chicklets Cups are up there. The Sandbaggers, I get a little bit nervous because Witt's the golfer, and he saves our bacon usually. And I can show up sometimes and shoot 110, but then sometimes I'm able to somehow turn it on and and shoot like a, like a you know 87 or 90. Yeah. Um, the, Timmy, we played you guys, and I was brutal. Like Timmy, uh, it was you and um, we beat him. We beat him. You and uh, I'm drunk. Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah, Jimmy. the, the uh, Jimmy Hayes, and yeah. you guys were just you guys were incredible. You guys beat us on like the like the fifteenth hole. You guys, yeah, dude, us. no, no, wait, 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 fucking. Uh, sorry, I got a little delay. Wit fucking texted me and Jimmy like that night. He's do. like eight a.m. He's like eight a.m. Thousand dollars each, and he fucking smoked. I mean, he smoked me. I was like, give it, like he's he, he's nuts about golf, and he's sick. Oh, Wit's good. Oh yeah, he's sick. Yeah, oh, he's unbelievable. He can pound the ball. So I get a little bit nervous because uh, I don't want to mess it up for him and annoy him all day. <laughs> um, but what else? Uh, I, so the best thing about Chicklets is, is, is because we have free reigns and it's our brand, we're able to kind of do any of these things. And uh, Knuckles, going back to, I guess, the, my ultimate answer would probably be the funnest stuff for me would be the acting. Are you ready to take your love for hockey to the next level? Join the Fight Club Raw Knuckles exclusive Patreon to unlock amazing perks like ad-free episodes, bonus interviews, and even a chance to win a game day experience with me in the Habs Cave. Don't miss out on this ultimate hockey experience. But anytime we're able to kind of have free creative reign, Knuckles, is that's where I, I love it and I'm having my most fun. I could imagine, right? Uh, and you, you wonder, like you said, how many companies would allow that? Okay, you write what you want. We're just like you fucking run with it. But Not many. Apparently, it, it worked with Watson glo Gloves, and that's awesome. Um, you, you know, analyzing players, like I, you know, I, you played the game. Tim's been there, and it's tough sometimes to, you want to be really honest with, guys and how guys are playing how difficult is that for you when you have to criticize guys and come down on them uh if they're not playing well I, you look at edmonton right now dry side old mcdavid they run that team they're not playing well they they don't play d it, you see where that team is right now how difficult is it for you to to really get on the critical um uh Pod, uh, uh, yeah, I, I so players. I never really I never really say a, a, a certain individual stinks. Uh, like I don't go. Well, not stinks, first. but not playing yeah. well. Uh, something. Oh, yeah, you, you, I, I have a point no, I'm trying to make. Yeah, I have no problem saying like Rick, right now Edmonton's defensive structure is a joke. It sucks. Like I have yeah. no problem saying that. Like it's like look at McDavid's face on the bench. Like he's oh. <laughs> he's saying it with his emotions, right? So. Uh, I, I don't personally have an issue, and as I get older, and I'm sure you would imagine, the separation for the game where there's these kids are so young, like, I try to not be too critical, like, because I wasn't a very good player individually, like, I, I was a, a healthy scratch, but I'm also self-deprecating about it, but I usually try to tell you why they're sucking and, and do it that way. Like, even with Line A, like, like Line A being healthy scratch, I, see, I saw some people being like, oh, like, you're going to lose the room, and it's just like, we all know, like, I watch Line out there, and, like, he, his body language doesn't suggest when he's when he's not scoring goals. It's, like, kind of like, why are we paying this guy $8.5 Like, if you're making $8.5 like, you see guys who make that. Like, look at Dylan Larkin. He's taking face-offs. He's killing penalties. He's winning puck battles along the wall. He's setting up uh, 
He's setting up uh, whoever his line mates are. He's scoring goals himself. Like, he makes nine and a half. So I just don't really – like, the body language and effort aspect, I'm like, why are people – like, who cares they healthy scratched him? Like, that would ha- – like, who cares? Like, he, he's probably deserved to be healthy scratched. But on the flip side, I also said, well, he's he has dealt with some concussion stuff this year. And and he, his father passed away close to two years ago. Yeah. So there's you always you always try to bring up the empathetic side of like there might be a reason mentally he's not into it right now. Like his concussion, the father thing, that's a lot piling on. I'm like, but if he's not playing well, like just because he's a star player, he he still deserves to be healthy scratched. I mean, do you feel the same, Timmy? Like, were you like, like who cares? Yeah, sit him down for a night. Yeah, no, I felt this. I, he, I, Liney even said something like, "This is the most embarrassing thing in my life," and I'm like, "Embarrassing?" I was like, "Fuck!" I, I love being healthy scratch just because I was in the NHL, but I'm, I'm not him. But <laughs> you know what I mean? I was just like, "Dude, that's not embarrassing. Go, go learn something." But yeah, man, I mean, it's uh, it's just a different game now, dude. I, that, I, that's how I feel. Like, and I think do you enjoy what you're doing now more than when you played. Uh, I would say, yeah, cause I don't have to fight anymore and I don't have to deal. Um, I don't know if I developed it from playing, but in knuckles, you, you might attest to this. I always had a fight or flight because I was a, um, a role player. And I, I, if I made a mistake early in the game, the chances were my ice time was going to dwindle. And then I was probably being pulled out of the lineup the next game. I, there yeah, was no room, for, no room for error on top of the anxiety about, okay, who am I going to have to fight? And, you know, am I going to be picking up my teeth on the ice? So I've developed that fight or flight to that's how the emotions I get the day of a broadcast, the day of a podcast coming into this interview or even doing an interview. So you get nervous. You get nervous. I just get this. Yeah. Fight or flight. You know, chicklets. I want to get to chicklets and the thing about chicklets. So Wit decides to do a podcast. You're still playing. And he ends up getting matched up with R.A. from Charlestown, the rear admiral, <clears throat> and they get going. When did they put the bug in your ear? Were they? And when did you kind of start getting excited about this could be something? So they went originally sent out the tweet asking. I think it was me and Colby Armstrong, and at the time I was still playing, um, and. I didn't even know what a podcast was. I'm like, uh. ah. Yeah. <laughs> and also, because I'd signed with LA's team in, in the minor league system, one of the agreements was from Dean Lombardi that I was going to stay off social media. So they were very anti-individual standing out. They were more about flying under the radar, greater good of the team. And, hey, we won, they won two Stanley Cups, and we got a, a, an AHL championship. I think he knows what he was doing. So I said, hey, Witt, I'm out. I can't do that. So Army said the same thing where he, I don't think he knew what podcasts were. So Rear Admiral saw his tweet and he reached out to him. And that's how it originally started. Like how Wit and, and because RA had worked with Barstool and Wit had followed Barstool and knew Dave Portnoy, Wit, like, I'm shocked that he agreed to do it with, with, with Rear, right? Because, like, yeah. you know. This guy just finished making 25 sheets in the show. Now he's doing a <laughs> he's fucking doing a podcast on RA's couch, sharing a mic. Like, come on. You know, this guy yeah. was snap, snapping tape to tape pod, uh, <laughs> passes with Crosby. Now yeah. he's swapping spit with the rear admiral. I was like, man, I hope I never retire. I hope I never retire when I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> so... They start out, uh, the the story of how Grinelli got involved is he was doing radio, he could produce, and he had a, uh, but R.A. was doing it through his mixer, R.A.'s mixer broke one yeah. podcast after R.A. had <laughs> drove it over uh, and spent an hour recording, he's like, oh my god, the, 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 you know, the mixer broke. So R.A. remember hearing, um, or re- reading the email from Grinelli, Grinelli joins on, they had me on for a couple interviews between like episode one and and 60 something whenever I hopped on and because I would come on and let it fly Wit asked me again and he was persistent and at that time I had just retired started doing radio for the Coyotes I said Wit let me let me get this one year under my belt and then let me reshuffle the deck and that Film project I, I did the summer before was about to be released. And I said, you know what? Why don't I come on the po- – join the podcast. We release this 
film project to kind of show that we have a different bag and we put it on YouTube and, and we, you know, and we kind of, this is how we do this lift off. And it was after the season had ended with the coyotes and I jumped on and the rest is history. We started doing more video work. We started, you know, getting more guests. We started doing at some points, two podcasts a week and then it evolved from there, and it took on a mind of its own. And with the vodka, the sandbaggers, the chicken cups, the FDNY, NYPD, brought, we're doing broadcast. It just, it's been a wild, wild, wild six years, but, you know, relentless work towards it and growing it. And with the help of Grinnell, Wit, RA, and uh, the rest of the staff, it's been a fucking crazy ride. Meteor, m- meteoric rise, and uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And, it, and and good on you. It's, and it's, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, it opened the door for... Yeah. You opened the door for, like, all podcasts, hockey-related, in my opinion, so it's awesome. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's no question. No question about it. And it I, is... That's the biggest compliment, And, and but, like, I, I always tell everyone, I said it's awesome because... The, the more the better, the more the merrier, because you guys are going to get maybe a guy on that I've never heard of or we would have never, and your connection with him extracts these incredible stories for any hockey fan who is going to come by your podcast and listen, right? And yeah. then it continues to grow, and yeah. and people fall in love more and more with the game. So it's awesome to see, and it's, uh, you know, it just so happens we were one of the first. I don't know if – I don't know who else was the first first actual – Ours was just able to kind of grow to a certain level. And the name is awesome, too. Spit and Chicklets. Like, come on. R.A. That's a fucking awesome name. It is. R.A. is the godfather of the podcast. And, you know, without his persistence, it obviously never happens. And I'm pretty sure that he thought of the name. And he kind of drew the logo on a napkin. So just a... An incredible, incredible name that he came up with, and or if he he heard it at a bar or something, or and it just clicked. I don't know. I, I should probably get the story from him how he thought of it. <laughs> get closer to the action in the Fight Club with the Raw Knuckles podcast over on Patreon. Whether you're an instigator, enforcer, or aiming for the Hall of Fame, there's something for everyone waiting for you. Don't miss your chance to be part of the ultimate hockey community. So, so Biz, now. I, I, God, you talked about coaches, how you love your coaches. You learned from a lot of them. And even Terry, and, you know, he taught you that, you know, to dig in and work hard, all this stuff. I want to bring up Babcock because you had the balls, one, along with the knowledge, because you did talk to somebody about what had happened and you had the balls to go with it. And a lot of people were saying, yeah, 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 you know, they, they weren't sure this, should you have said it or not, but you did. You had, you had the gym to do it, which I love. And then we see what happens from that. And, and, and it was true. We have Marty Walsh on. And I talked to Marty about that. One of the first things he did, you know, was go down there and interview the players and talk to the players. And, and he actually told Tim and, Tim and I that it wasn't, um, he said it wasn't just that. There were some other things that really bothered him. Yes. You, and and I don't know what those things were. I didn't push him on it. He didn't. Me neither. It, yeah. Me neither. And, and I, I got to wonder what the hell that was, you know? And that's just crazy what he was doing. Fuck. It, it, what the hell is it with that guy? So, How, yeah, so, how's he not it, learn? Yeah, so I heard the same thing. So like, and, and like, I didn't dig for information, and, and and even if I did find out, I probably wouldn't say what it was on here. I'll be vague about probably the worst thing that I heard was just having a young guy over, assuming the guy was going to go over there for lunch in the summertime in Michigan to Babcock's like lake house. And then when he got there, he asked him to see his phone and he hooked it up to airplay mode and let, looked through it. And I heard it was photos and texts. So just a, obviously a, a pretty bizarre interaction that you would have with your head coach. Like that's just obviously that's, I think, it, uh, normal workplace, like you're done. No, like that's you're a, fucking a, done is right. That's an HR nightmare. So the I guess in – if people, if we can go back, it kind of happened over the course of two podcasts where I completely forgot that I'd even told Wit that I'm like, oh, listen to this one. 
I'm like, I'm going to talk about this on the podcast because a player had reached out originally and told me like about the phone thing. And he was now doing it to guys in Columbus. And my buddy who texted me, I know that how his experience with Babcock had gone. And listen, there's a difference between like a softer generation and not being able to be accountable and poopy yeah. pants. And then things that, that, like he was doing and saying, which like I just – my favorite coach ever was Mike Stuthers, and he would come on and lose it on us between periods and like single guys out. And I love him. I love him to this day, and I talk to him all the time. So we're talking about two different things. So my buddy's experience and the way and how ticked off he sounded when telling me what was going on made me want to say it on the podcast to make players on Columbus aware of it but not to kick up the dust that ended up coming from it. Yeah, It just so happens the day that we drop the podcast, it's NHL Media Day in Vegas. So this thing, we put the clip out. The guys do the way they clip things. I, you know, that's, that's a, a behind-the-scenes production thing. And this thing goes nuclear. It, it was like 7 million views on the Twitter video that we put out. So all of a sudden, they're putting out the fires, this and that. But ultimately... It came, it came down to the statement coming out. It was our words versus theirs. And then, thankfully, the more the, 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 the players' union dug into it, it ended up everything I obviously said was happening, which would ha- had happened in Toronto before to the player that I used to, that, that I know, was happening now in Columbus. And it just seemed as if, though, this guy hadn't learned his lesson. So I just wanted to kind of be like, bring light to it and be like, hey, buddy fuck off and then as a result everything ended up happening where he ended up getting canned yeah. like even originally when was i heard phone, he was, doing was, you, that, was your phone I, just off the hook <clears throat> was it like did it yeah just go it went, it went crazy that? but yeah like but remember i was saying it to just kind of be like yo idiot smarten up you yeah. already got canned for this i'm like what the f- what are you fucking doing now like you just, yeah. you just came away from a four year absence and you're doing this shit before <laughs> training camp starts like what planet am i on so so yeah and then like i said never in my wildest dreams that i think it was going to get to what it got to and or would he be fired it was more just to be, make him be like hey smarten the fuck up buddy so that's the story and there was never any like I'm gonna be a white knight. It was it was me looking out for my buddy, and my buddy my buddy was the one who said say this on the podcast. And after hearing it, like my buddy had been traded there to to Toronto, and like he went there in the summer. And the first thing that happened was he's like, "Let me see the phone." And he, he had other teammates apologizing to him because he's like, "Hey, they has a, had a designated guy that would warn guys when they got to the team." to be aware that if you go in the coach's room, don't bring your phone. And if he <laughs> asks, say, tell, tell him you left it in the car. Yeah. Like what? Wow. I have it in my safe wow. at home. Yeah. Fuck. You fucking weirdo. You, 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 you bring in a flip phone. You're like, oh, here. This is, it's like a fake flip <laughs> yeah, phone. Yeah. Here's, my, here's my burner. So yeah. I hope I did a good job of breaking that all down. No, you did. All the you praise did. should go to the PA. All the praise should go to the guy who made me aware of it. And it sucks that the guys in Columbus were put in that situation. And it was probably a very messy thing to have to deal with before the season started. And fuck, have they been off to a tough start. What do you think the fuck stick Babcock was expecting to find on these phones? What kind of information? What do you think? He's trying to get a read of someone's personality, you think? Or what they? What do you the think com- he was looking for? The, the, well, the comment that was made uh, to, to the people that I know that he went through was like, oh, so you like to party. I think that he wants to know who's like, 1,000% invested where they're like not drinking and having fun and going out and, and or – I don't know, like maybe you have a dark sense of humor and you share like crazy memes with your buddies. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what the, what he, he want, he wanted to garner from that. The text message situation from the young player who went over, apparently he searched his name and there was text message like of maybe that player's buddy, like, like, like you know, Babcock's name coming up via text. Yeah. Uh, so... Like, I, I don't know, maybe he was embarrassed at his actions and thought the guys behind the scenes would be joking around and texting behind his back. And his insecurity led him to look to, to the phone where it's like, 
hey, buddy, like, yeah, maybe they are saying you're a psycho. Maybe fucking, maybe act otherwise where their experience won't be. So they, they won't be texting about that. Or the next time their buddy's like, hey, what's Babcock like? It's like, you know what? He's actually a changed guy and a good dude. He wasn't yeah. looking through my dick pics that I was sending in this Instagram <laughs> thought, <laughs> you know, naked with a leather too. belt it's like, around your neck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's another thing too. It's like the privacy <laughs> aspect is like somebody, I think it was uh, Sarah uh, Siv uh, who does great yeah. reporting uh, from North, uh, from Carolina, right? From Carolina. Yeah. She worked, she, I, I think she was with the athletics. She might still be. She does work with BR with us now and, and uh, TNT. But she's like, what if a player was a closet gay and he didn't, he wasn't comfortable coming out yet, and and hadn't even came out to his parents, and now Mike Babcock knows before the parents, right. and he it's sits like, him on the bench. The phone is a, yeah. a private area, and right. and that's where that's where the line was crossed, and and just bizarre, bizarro land. Um, speaking of lines, how about the fucking red line? No. I get the NHL and I will watch today's game as opposed to, you know, back in my day, a lot of fighting, the two line pass, all that. Um, we talk about concussions. We talk about the health of the players, the speed of the game. The, they want to sell speed. They want to sell that physical aspect. Yeah, players today are so good with the puck, all that stuff. Do you think the red line and everybody worries about the trap coming back? I get it. But do you think, the red line coming back into hockey would be a good thing or a bad thing. I I don't have any strong opinion on it. Sidney Crosby was asked what rule change would he implement, and he said bring the red line back. And I I think Wayne also agreed with him. Yeah. And also a lot of these other players with that hockey mind. So who the hell is Paul Bissonnette to disagree with these guys? As soon as they said it, I'm like, okay, they're on to something that I have no clue about. And for whatever reason, they think that that's going to bring back more offense and and more like make the game better. I would be down to bring it back, but I don't think they would ever do it because I think it's probably deemed one of the best decisions that Gary Bettman has ever made from, a, from an offensive perspective because mm-hmm. – all of a sudden, the the offense did pick up, but Knuckles, you can you could also argue that there are just these different eras of hockey that change the game. Whereas now, all of a sudden, the skill set and what these players are able to do and how they're able to shoot the puck because of the technology, it's like now we're back up to McDavid. In, in certain players and enough players being able to break a hundred points where there was a time where, where if you were a point of game player, you were the elite player in the league. Like they, I think they call it, what do they call it? The dead puck era. Yeah. So I don't know why it is Sid and Wayne and some of these great players think to bring it back is the right call, but I am all years and I'd be down to try it. But I don't think, would you agree that I don't think it's ever happening? That's the last thing they would consider changing. Yeah, I, I think they have a real hard time with it. And now, if it could be brought up, I don't know which way the players would vote. And I say that because, listen, here's the deal. I think these guys are so talented t- today, and they're worried about the trap. Well, teams still fucking trap, and they can trap if they want through the neutral zone. You can clog the neutral zone. You're either playing a 1-2-2, two, two, a 1-3-1, one, one, or a left-wing lock. Like, it's – if you want to clog that neutral zone, you can. I think – what is missed a lot in the game is teams coming up the ice together and really being able to pass their way through the neutral zone into the offensive zone and actually getting a forecheck going. Because you look, right, that stretch pass, right, what's it do? Well, it opens up the, the, the neutral zone, but it allows a player to maybe chip the puck in, but it also allows a D-man to get back there quicker knowing that it's coming and it takes away a, the the four checking part of the game. You yeah. know, I, I think it really. Yeah. They, so there's, there's, I don't know. I, my I, thought, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I I agree with you completely that it also like. So I do believe though the successful teams in the league do come up the ice together, yeah. and that's one thing where. Like I feel like the Leafs tend to be a type of stretch team that like yeah. that long home run pass, and you know you can name others where 
I feel like the successful teams, like, like L.A., when I played for the Kings organization, low and slow for the centermen through the blue paint yeah. usually in, the, in the D zone coming up. And you you come out, you know, as as a five-man group. And if, you know, if it, once it gets moved to the wall, if if the centerman is covered by the F3, you activate the net front defenseman. Yeah. And, and then come up I the weak side. So those are all things that we – we did together. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. No, I was going to say, I think it's, Tim, I what think did you, it's also, gonna say yeah. Some? I would say, yeah, I think it's also going to add like this annoying, like coaches challenge just to add up 50 more of those. Like, you, cause the game's so fast and they already do that with the offsides and that's fucking annoying. You know what I mean? I, I think it's annoying. Like, uh, I, I don't know. Right. Am I wrong? You know, like, oh, yeah, it's coach's yeah, challenge. I don't know. It's, you know. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Timmy. You're saying that all of a sudden they're going to be challenging two line passes. Where I think yeah, they, should, yeah. I think they should abolish both challenges at both lines. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, Tim. All right, um, serious standpoint. Do you have when you look back over your career? Um, do you have any regrets in hockey? And if you do. Uh, if you could change it, what would it be? Do you have any regrets during um, the game? Yeah, I would probably spe- I would say spend more time with my teammates um, from uh, like a not drinking and partying perspective. I, I think I partied and drank too much. I was just young and in the NHL and I couldn't even believe that I was even actually there. And I don't want to say I took it for granted. I just kind of took I kind of it took it all in where I would show up to the rink and, and work hard and, and that wasn't I would still train in the summer but I just had a little I think that if I would have boozed and partied less and just kind of like hung out with my teammates from a, a, a more a better connecting level obviously drinking your there's team camaraderie there but more of like a a life level connection and and probably listen to a lot more of Shane Doan's advice. Um, I think I would have been better <laughs> off. I also think that it would have I, my my NHL career probably could have lasted two three years longer, like just yeah. from maybe taking it a little bit more seriously. But I believe being that idiot and clown and and kind of experiencing all that is what kind of led me into the the, the post career. So it's I, no so no I wouldn't change it. And no, it's not really a regret. Yeah, but I that's hear you. the one thing. If I had to go back and do, maybe I would change. I hear you. I hear you. Um, is um, mom and dad still alive, Biz? Yeah, my parents are alive. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, dad, are you close with your dad? And 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 what, what does your dad think of? Certainly, your hockey career. How proud was he of you? And then. This next chapter in your life, he must be like, "What the hell, my son? Like, what what he's done with himself? Like, it's he's, he must be proud, no?" He, yeah, he he he's always been a very proud guy. He was never uh, he he didn't even if I didn't want to play, he would have been like, "Okay," and but he was ultra supportive, and he was he when I was in the NHL, he'd be bouncing off the walls in the rink, meeting friends <laughs> with people at the urinal for, for crying out loud. So uh, he. He's uh, a steel saw, worker, your dad? Was he, he was a steel worker. Tough guy? I just, I just tough, saw somebody in the, in the chat say, yeah. say, was he tough? Yeah. And no, my father was a softy, and I, I'm I'm a softy too, like at heart. I'm a, you know, a, he's he's a very loving, caring guy. I would say that, that as the years have gone on, sometimes he's maybe not the best at expressing his emotions, so he's a little bit old school in that sense. But just yeah, he's always he was always a loving and supporting father, and uh, he worked hard, man. He worked at a steel mill, got up every day at five o'clock, and went to work, and supported my my hockey career. And you know, graph skates for eight hundred bucks, he'd probably have to work a full week to pay for him. You know, so right at, in the steel in the steel plant. So l- incredible father and c- incredible upbringing. My mother was a college professor who was actually the breadwinner. And and had a, an insane work ethic. I I am a lot closer with my mom because we just we share the same brain. We can interact on a on a on a high level. Whereas my, my dad's okay sitting on the couch eating potato chips, watching sports all day. And <laughs> and and if if it wasn't for my mom, the bills wouldn't get paid. She I got runs, one for she you, runs, Biz. She runs the show and his show. 
<laughs> Viz, um, Nux, he hate, Nux hates two, two things he hates most in, in life is being called Niles and the, iP- the iPad on the bench. Do you like the iPads on the bench? <laughs> Uh, no, I, 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 uh, I understand why they're doing it. And maybe because this younger generation, that's how they learn. I, I'm okay with some people can learn by you when you talk to them. Some people need to be visual learners. And I would consider that being a visual learner. But I think that you could probably save it to the locker room. There you go. Unless Niles, it's. Hey, it's, fuck off. Oh, Niles. Fuck. <laughs> Come on. Don't be taking advantage of me now. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Knuckles. But uh, I would say that, like, what if it's something on power play where you get an opportunity later in that period? Like, it's just, like, it's hard for me to touch, take such a strong stance again against it. But I love how old school coaches, like, uh, like Torts, is like, get these fucking iPads off the bench. You know. Yeah. It would be the same as, as I think that when guys grab them, when they come back after every shift, I think that uh, that would concern me. If I'm a general manager and I go watch a junior game that I'm scouting of a top prospect and he's grabbing the iPad after every shift, I would I would do some digging. All right. Um, about- Doesn't Suzuki do it? Yeah, the, the, some of them do it. I, I, I don't like when they look at it on the bench. Like, get ready for the next fucking shift. Watch the game. If, if you got an issue, like you had a problem on the ice with one of your wingers and you had to talk to them, talk to them about it. And between periods, go and fucking say, can we look at something, coach, or whatever, or look at it in the locker room. I hate it on the bench. I fucking hate it. But I'm not there. Um, is there anything, if you look at, Paul Bissonette today, and you have that self-reflection. Like you just said, when you look back when you played, um, the drinking pot. Like I had to take a good look at myself, and I had to take that out of my life, no question about it. Um, Is there anything – because I made some changes in my life. Is there anything that Paul Bissonette would change in his life today if he – in that um, self-reflection piece? Yeah, yeah, like I, uh, geez, that's a great freaking question, Knuckle. <laughs> um, yeah, like well, I I'm mean, trying just, to get you on that higher I, level, like your mom. Yeah. <laughs> well, just I just think as you get older, you just you, know, you just try to really understand what's important and and uh, and and become more selfless. And I guess it's hard because I don't have kids, right? And I'm I'm not married, and those are usually things that really advance those types of things. I think I was like maybe a late bloomer because. You know, I left home at 16 and, you know, it's almost like you're fending for yourself. So you're kind of in this survival mode. And as you get older, you're just more of just thinking about like how to, you know, what are maybe what's the next guy going through. So you always try to be nice to, to everybody and constantly remind yourself. So I guess I wouldn't change it. It's just continue to try to evolve that that side of, of uh, you know, being more of a human, humanitarian, trying to do more for others and, and yeah. being more That's empathetic. Cool. So just more more of that stuff. You, you know, want. I think that when you're 25 in the NHL and you got the world by the balls, I don't think you you're I don't think that's top of mind. You're chasing girls yeah. and worrying about your next. Oh, mm-hmm. where are we going next? Yeah. So just kind of kind of growing into that. I would also say maybe men are a little bit later in that category. For sure. And maybe that's a, a sex, sexist stereotype that I'm going to end up getting canceled for. But <laughs> <laughs> You're uncancelable. Um, you can't you be think- canceled. Yeah. No, don't say that. No. Oh. Knock yeah, on knock wood. On. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm... Calling all hockey lovers. Upgrade your podcast experience by becoming an enforcer. Gain access to the greatest hockey doc ever, The Last Gladiators. And don't settle for ordinary. Join the Fight Club over on Patreon today. What um, do you, uh, when you talk about that, you're not married. Do you want to be married one day? And if you do... Listen, or I have a family, but if you do, you're going to have to find an awfully special woman. I, yeah. To be able I, to deal with the, the way you go. You're gone all the time. You're like a Navy SEAL, fucking gone eight months a year. <laughs> yeah, I had an awesome girl, and I, 
and it, I just, I, I couldn't find the balance. Like I just, my, my mind and head were too occupied. And I, I, you know, I, I just, it's hard, man. Like it's, yeah, I, I wasn't ready to make that type of commitment. And she, you know, she wanted a family. She was a you know, wonderful, loving, caring, like just all the things like, and yes, to, to put up with me, you definitely have to be all those things. Cause my mind's never rarely in the present. Right. So, yeah, I think that one day I'm, I'm going to see if I can get there, but I've always also been one where if I'm going to bring a child onto, onto this planet, like I want to be a, a, a present father and, uh, you know, have a present, uh, parenting, what do you call roll, it? Roll. Uh, because that's how I was raised. And I feel that that I probably feel that there's a lot of people who shouldn't be having kids who have kids because they're not ready for that type of commitment to be yeah. present and involved and, and support them and, and, you know, do be selfless for their children. So yes, I believe that I'm going to want to pass that on and be that person one day. I just don't have the time to do it. So until I'm ready to say I'm ready for that commitment, I don't think I'm going to do it. I would say that I, I have a number in my head about 45. I, th I think that I would probably want to start having kids. Which and is where you're 38. So how many kids, how many kids now. do you have out there though? Really? How many kids, how many kids do you have out there? <laughs> That I you know I, of. I always well on Father's Day. <laughs> no. I always shut my phone off, so I I don't know. I mean, I mean, no, but but I, I no none so far. And uh, I mean, I commend people who do it. Timmy, how many you got? I got two, and <clears throat> I love to hate them. <laughs> it's. I mean, yeah. It, I heard it's the most. No, they're awesome. Thing in the they're world. awesome. And yeah. another thing too, it's like I wake up and the first thing I think about is work and chiclets and, and what's going on with TNT and what are we doing yeah. next? And, and I want to, I think that when you have kids, you wake up and all of a sudden you have this other concern that you have to Ooh, worry yeah. about 24 seven. Oh yeah. And that, that is a, a very strong burden. And, and now I get why they have a, a day to celebrate mothers and fathers. They should get a week. Yeah. So Biz, you're not a big, <laughs> month, month. you're not a big cheese. Um, you still do all your own scheduling. That's you have help. Have an assistant. That's what everybody keeps wow. telling me to get. Get but, an assistant. But I do have a a, a, a guy named Jeff Jacobson. So you know, Gr Gr uh, Grinelli and all those guys, they do the podcast side, and you know, Grinelli helps in so many different areas. Jeff Jacobson is like my agent slash helps me with all like all things decision making and how to navigate it all and i i i trust him dearly we were friends before anything and he helped me like i at one point one of my other buddies said hey you should have jeff take a look at that and i was like oh like he does that and he, he's like yeah he does a sp he's speaking company owns a speaking company but he helps with like types of contracts in this and that's how the relationship started so uh he helps me with all that type of stuff but i'm not some guy cruising around with like a film team or i'm from well in ontario i'm i'm very simple guy um because this is a hockey podcast and you do a hockey podcast who is today the most underrated player in the nhl and who's the most overrated oh my god Oof, under underrated underappreciated to give me like a, a minute to yeah, kind of yeah uh, we gave you, you an hour earlier we'll give you a minute fuck yeah do we, you, we uh, still have part two of this we still have part two of this you, you got plenty oh, of time I, hey, it's thanksgiving and i'm in a hotel room by myself in atlanta boys i, I can out i can outlast you pro i promise um uh, do either you guys have a name in mind as far as underrated underappreciated underrated um fuck think about a guy maybe in tampa i kucherov is pro he, he's so good but i mean point maybe yeah point. i like that one what, yeah. points one of my guys yeah. underrated yeah Cause and, you know we always think of yeah scoring points, goals, assists, all that stuff. But boy, does that kid bring it and and just does not. I don't think overall he gets the attention he deserves. But uh, cool. Um, 
Fuck. Uh, uh, <sighs> uh. I mean, people might say, ah, oh, he's, he's talked about it all the time, but like what Crosby's doing at his age still is yeah. like, it's, it's, it's insanity. With the time that he's lost and like, inflation for his era and stuff, I think, like, I think that he ends up on the Mount Rushmore of hockey. Some people might say, oh, he's already there. But he has to go down as the top four players all time if he does this for another two, three years. If he, if he wins another cup, it's undeniable. Yeah. But if he's putting up 100 points at 36, 37, 38 – uh, like who did that? Yeah. Who, did, who did that? Who is did, who is your Mount who, Rushmore? Who, who, who else that? is on there? Well, obviously Wayne. You it have is. to put you have to put Gordy, and then you have and then you have to put you. Yeah, I, I think you have to put Bobby Orr. Oh be- yeah, because he you know. He, he kind of like nobody had ever seen anything like that from a defenseman. The only thing that sucks is the the, the longevity aspect of what. Yeah, he was ten doing. years, lucky, right? Nine, yeah, ten years he had, but still. So, right. Up. So, and then is there a fourth that you would put before Sid? I mean, people would Mario. I, I put, well, yeah, the, yeah, Mark, Jesus Christ. So, yes, yeah, so, like, and 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 Wayne would even tell you if he stayed healthy, he would have broke his record. So. It's, I guess it's hard to remove one of those guys because they're like kind of the founding fathers. But I would say that if Crosby does this for – if he does what he's doing now for another three years and he's won the cups he's won and the awards he's won, do you not say that he might be there instead of Bobby Orr? Is that is – that is, am, I, am I swearing? Have I offend you, offended you more than calling you Niles? <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, I think you have to put all there either way. You, okay. you got you have to put all there. So he he revolutionized the game. He changed the game. So as far as underrated, I mean that's kind of an off the board answer. And uh, or, uh, yeah, underrated. And then uh, I don't know, Timmy. You help me out here. It's such overrated. A... Oh, come on, Tim. Overrated. Grind I know. it. No, I'm mean, that's. Oh, let me. I'm gonna say. I can't even think of anyone o- overrated. Maybe uh, uh, I don't know. Who I guess basically who sucks right now <laughs> besides McDavid? No, they're actually not. I mean, the team sucks, but um, overrated. Uh, most overrated NHLer. Come on. I honestly can't, and people probably think I'm just trying to be too nice. I can't think of somebody off the top. Now, is the chat saying anybody? I didn't just see it. No. I no. Wonder if it, says, it says Lemieux or how? How about? <laughs> that was for the Mount Rushmore. That was Mount Rushmore. Yeah, yeah, um, no, I'm kidding. Um, how about, how about uh, Seth Jones? Well, he's being paid. I, I think that people understand what, what kind of the situation. I think that he he it was a desperate team at a desperate time, and they, you know, they he was kind of that guy. And yeah, it was an overpay. It's kind of a Darnell Nurse situation, yeah, right? Right. We should be making you know six six and a half million bucks, not nine and a half, or in Seth Jones's case, or I guess they probably make around the same. Seth might even be closer to ten. So. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate because some of these guys just get paid way too much, and I mean, like, look what Huberto is going through right now. Whew, he's yeah, making ten and right? a half the next eight, right? So what about like, uh, what about guys... Kuznet? What about Kuznetsov? Isn't he? Is he get paid a lot? No, I bet he's probably making seven million bucks, and I don't think anybody thinks he's anything other than you know a good good offensive threat, but. With all the, I don't. He doesn't want to be in Washington right now, so that's kind of a, a, a tough, uh, a tough situation. I, I got nothing for you. I got the Crosby okay. underrated. I, I, I know it's a horrible answer. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's not, uh, not the end of the world, right? Uh, you ask me another question like that, I'll be calling you Niles again. <laughs> come you on, fuck me. off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before I just I come love how to Atlanta. We, I, we asked you a question. We asked you a Before question. I come to we didn't Atlanta. even have an answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I yeah. Have an answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, so, 
boy, the audience you guys got in Spit and Chicklets, it just grew. What, what, what was the biggest jump you think in the audience from when you started to like all of a sudden? What, what do you, listen, I get the atmosphere, the locker room, you said it. But what was like that year that all of a sudden you saw this jump and you really realized, shit, we, we got something going on here big time. We, um, I mean, we just, we, we got some big name interviews. Like the, like the, the big jump was when we got Crosby and McKinnon in Halifax. Yeah. So that was, uh, that kind of just, and then, and then also we captured the first ever standbagger there. So that was another boom, big boost to the, to the, uh, like a, a social series. So that was a, probably a time where, it took another big jump and probably the one of the biggest from when I originally, originally hopped on because people were also like, all of a sudden I was, I had a million Twitter followers and I was tweeting about this show I was doing. So that that's why the original jump went from, I don't know what they were getting for downloads, maybe, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 on some, maybe some guests got over, you know, over 80, but then we started getting like, you know, hundreds of thousands. Uh, that's unbelievable. Okay. Yeah, Good for you been, guys. When did yeah, Barstool awesome. come in? When, now, when did Barstool come in? Barstool was was there early on. They because McGon Brian McGonagall, okay. Barstool Sport, RA was doing blogs for them, so they took it over and made it on put it on their platform. Twenty podcasts in. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. All right, Biz. Before I let you go. Yeah, this has been awesome. This is so fun. You guys have had awesome questions. I'm going to um, – I want to ask you uh, if you're going to write your own eulogy, what is the first line of it? You're going to write your own eulogy. Give me your What's first eulogy? line. <laughs> eulogy is like uh, like something that is put in the what? paper about no, – No, when, when say when you die – or well, I was to die, and someone's uh, going to write a eulogy f- about you, but you got to write the first line. You want uh, people to remember something to be like, uh, like passive and self-deprecating to like push the attention uh, off of like, and they kind of just like be like, I hope you're all having a cocktail right now, fucking making <laughs> you know making fun of my my nuances and, and, and how big of an idiot I was. He was self funny, self deprecating, and well, j- y- just just like so- basically something to kind of get the mood shifted to a laugh, and everybody being like, you know what, let's have some pops and tell stories about B- Biz being an idiot, because I I find it weird when you know, like yeah, like I, I and just kind of. From, from yeah, from a eulogy perspective, just kind of like I guess thank everybody who made made life awesome and and uh, and make sure that they're ha- they're having a big party to celebrate uh, you know one last time I guess. Cool. Listen, Biz, I I, I want to thank you for joining us. Awesome, it was awesome to have you. Um, again, we'll we'll be watching, and um, I wish you continued success in what you're doing. You you really made a great uh, second career for yourself. It's awesome. Awesome Boys, to see. I, I appreciate the tire pump. I'm I'm so happy you guys are doing this. You guys are kicking ass. Um, I'll never call you Niles again. And <laughs> let's let's do it more often, man. Like I said, you guys, this was a once fun a conversation. Week. Once a week, we'll have you on. <laughs>